Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and we're going to continue our reading of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, today we're in week number three, uh, day number three, and we're going to be reading from Exodus chapter one to chapter three. These are the names of the sons of Israel, that is Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. In all, Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. In time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that gen entire generation. But their descendants, <clears throat> the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, Look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build their, the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. Then Pharaoh the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this, he demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, Throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. Things had changed, right? Remember I told you uh, when we finished our reading in the book of Genesis that years pass. Uh, Joseph was dead. All of the <coughs> sons of Jacob were dead. Uh, and it had been generations and a pharaoh arose. Remember, pharaoh's the title for the king at the time. It's not the same individual. But a pharaoh came to power who did not know Joseph, did not know that previous generation. Some years had passed. All he knew was the people of Israel were gaining more power. They're, they're larger in number. And usually that's how power is dictated, by numbers. And, and so that caused him to fear, and he seek, sought to control the situation, and, he, and his strategy was to kill every baby boy. But God was protective, very protective, through the, what the midwives did. And so you can see the Pharaoh, he, is just, he has hate filled in his heart. It, it's really like a preview of what Herod is going to do to try to kill the Messiah. 
There's so many patterns here. So many, if, if you go back, if the Jews would go back and read the story of Genesis and the story of Exodus, they would see the patterns. Chapter 2. About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. So she lays this basket with a baby boy put in it, and, and it doesn't really float down the water. It just lays among the reeds there. Then the baby's sister then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. So this man and woman from the tribe of Levi who gave birth to a son, she saw that he was special. She keeps him hidden for at least three months because the rule was, as in, at the end of chapter one, a newborn baby boy, throw him in the Nile River. And so they know that his that they can't keep him hid forever. And so, in a sense, the baby is supposed to be thrown into the Nile River to drown and die. But she puts, <laughs> uh, she puts the baby in a basket and laid him among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. What's going to happen? Soon, Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the river bank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? She asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. So Pharaoh's daughter comes down to bathe, and her attendants are walking along the riverbank, and, they, and when the princess sees the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her, and right, they open it, they see the baby, the little boy's crying, they felt sorry for him. And they deduced very quickly, this must be one of the Hebrew children. They know what the command is. They know what the edict is. So this little girl walks up. Unbeknownst to the princess, that's the child's baby sister. And so, because of the princess and her willingness to let the girl find someone to nurse the child... Turns out that the nurse is the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. So she's not only going to be able to spend time with her son, nurse him, but earn money from it for provisions and, and help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. The water was supposed to be the place of death for every Hebrew boy, but not for Moses. His name, his representative, the name that she gave that baby boy is representative of how he was saved from that edict. You see God's protection again. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up my... Why are you beating up your friend? 
Moses said to the one who had started the fight. The man replied, Who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid, thinking everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened, and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came as usual to draw water and fill the water trials for their father's flocks. But some other shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Then he drew water for their flocks. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked, Why are you back so soon today? An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, they answered. And then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Then where is he? their father asked. Why did you leave him there? Invite him to come and eat with us. Moses accepted the invitation, and he settled there with him. In time, Ruel gave Moses, his daughter, Zipporah, to be his wife. Later, she gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom. For he explained, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Years passed, and the king of Egypt died. But the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and, they, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. Chapter 3 <coughs> One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Moses is about ready to meet God. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. Only God knows how to do that. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Brizites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. 
Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my eternal name my name to remember for all generations. Now go and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me. He told me, I have been watching closely, and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey, <coughs> the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. The elders of Israel will accept your message. Then you and the elders must go to the king of Egypt and tell them, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So please let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go, unless a mighty hand forces him. So I will raise my hand and strike the Egyptians, performing all kinds of miracles among them, and then at last he will let you go. And I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably on you. They will give you gifts when you go, so you will not leave empty-handed. Every Israelite woman will ask for articles of silver and gold and fine clothing from her Egyptian neighbors and from the foreign women in their houses. You will dress your sons and daughters with these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. This reminds me in a sense of what uh, God had said to Abraham in Genesis 15. Told him about what's going to happen. Here God is revealing to Moses in this burning bush as God meets with Moses, calls him into to this ministry of, of representing God to the people of the nation of Israel. Well, they're not a nation yet, but they are a people. And God is sending Moses there. And he tells them, you're going to appear before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's not going to let them go, but I will force him. A mighty hand will force him. All kinds of miracles are going to be produced among them. And at last he'll let you go. It's as though Moses, representing the people of Israel, or leading the people of Israel through God, that God is going to do a work where Israel, this future nation that God is going to establish that go, that's going to come out of Egypt. God is going to raid the Egyptians and Israel is going to have all kinds of blessings given to her because of God's sovereign choices, because of God's sovereign plan. And when you understand that God is sovereign, you can only respond by faith, by believing in Him and trusting Him, even if you don't understand everything. As Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24 states, He leads and directs the steps. We may not understand it all, but that's okay. We're not to worry about understanding it all. When we walk by faith, it means that we may not understand everything. It means that we may not fully see the big picture. But God is the one who designs the big picture. And He will reveal to us what we need to know at that moment, when we need to know it. These are great chapters. It's wonderful to be able to read them. Let's pray. Dear God, we do thank you again for all that you show us in your word, how you are sovereignly in charge and always leading and guiding. We've been seeing this as we read through Genesis, and now we're already seeing it in the book of Exodus. Lord, this story is a picture 
of your saving grace, of your saving mercy, and how you fulfill your plans. What happens in these chapters will be spoken of for generations. What, you, what happens in these chapters will be used as, as stories to remind us of who you are and the power of, uh, that you have, the ultimate power, the almighty power that you have. And Lord, there will be truths that will come up in, even in the Old Testament, especially in the New, that will remind us of these stories of these things that t took place in this world that truly happened, that truly occurred. Lord, we thank you that we have this opportunity to read them, meditate upon them, and Lord, that you allow us to live for you each and every day. May you receive all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.